Good afternoon. Happy Monday. Good to see everyone. Uh, just one item at the top, and then we'll uh, take your questions. The United States condemns the overnight attack by the Houthis on the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, which resulted in civilian injuries in Saudi Arabia and follows a similar Houthi incursion last week that killed three civilians in Abu Dhabi. We reaffirm our commitment to help strengthen the defense of our Saudi and Emirati partners. These attacks on the UAE and Saudi Arabia, as well as recent airstrikes in Yemen that killed civilians, represent a troubling escalation that only exacerbates the suffering of the Yemeni people. We call on all parties to the conflict to commit to a ceasefire, abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law, including those related to protection of all civilians, and participate fully in an inclusive UN-led peace process. The Yemeni people urgently need a diplomatic solution to the conflict, a diplomatic solution that improves their lives and allows them to collectively determine their own future. Uh, with that, I'm happy to turn to your questions. Yes? Uh, well, yeah. I'll start back there, as I, as I promised, please. I have three, three questions. Okay. So Great. Today, the attack in the United States is the second one in the last 10 days. So these attacks have been accelerated lately. Are we going to see now the same acceleration in the consideration process by the Biden, Biden administration to enlist the Houthis on the terrorist attack? To sorry, to enlist them back on the terrorist oh, attack. Oh, to 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 uh, so list them. So this acceleration would be resulted in the same acceleration in the consideration process that's been taken care by the by the administration regarding putting them back on the terrorist attack. So your question is about the uh, status of the Houthis uh, and a potential redesignation. Well, as you know, the pre uh, the president spoke to this last week uh, when he spoke to the nation in his press conference uh, last. Wednesday. Uh, he said that the question of the redesignation, potential redesignation of Ansrallah, uh, the name for uh, the Houthi movement, um, uh, is under consideration. Uh, and so I'm not in a position to discuss uh, any potential uh, steps uh, that might be uh, considered. Uh, here's what I will say, though. Um, we will continue to work uh, with our partners in the region, including Saudi Arabia uh, and the UAE, uh, to help them uh, defend uh, against these deplorable Houthi attacks. Uh, as uh, the last data I saw uh, indicated, uh, with the help of the United States, uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has been able to uh, prevent about 90 percent uh, of these incoming uh, attacks from Yemen, uh, from the Houthis. Of course, our goal, our collective goal, will to get, to get that to be uh, 100 percent, um, but we are still, um, uh, we will continue to stand by uh, our, our partners on this. Uh, we are also, and we have, uh, continuing to hold to account uh, Houthi leaders uh, for this reprehensible conduct. Uh, we have issued uh, sanctions uh, on key leaders and designations on key leaders uh, in recent months. And we will continue to call uh, upon all appropriate tools uh, in our toolkit uh, to hold uh, these uh, Houthis, those Houthi leaders responsible uh, for these attacks uh, accountable. Uh, we will not relent in designating Houthi leaders and entities involved in military offensives uh, that are threatening civilians and regional stability, uh, perpetuating the conflict, uh, committing human rights abuses, uh, or uh, violating international human humanitarian law, uh, or exacerbating uh, the very grave humanitarian crisis uh, by, uh, according to most accounts, uh, is the most profound humanitarian crisis uh, on the face of the earth. Um, but this is a complex consideration, uh, and we spoke to this consideration uh, in the earliest days of the administration, about a year ago now, uh, when we talked about uh, the initial decision vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Houthis. Uh, because in making that determination and in coming to that original decision, uh, we listened uh, to a number of stakeholders. Uh, we heard warnings from the UN. Uh, we listened to uh, concerns from humanitarian groups. Uh, we listened to bipartisan uh, members uh, of Congress uh, who uh, were opposed uh, to the last administration's decision to designate uh, the Houthis uh, as a foreign terrorist uh, organization and an SGDT uh, because primarily uh, that blanket determination uh, could conceivably have an impact on our ability to deliver and to provide much needed humanitarian relief to the citizens uh, of Yemen. Um, 
uh, it could ac uh, also impact access to basic commodities uh, like food and fuel. And so we heard those concerns loud and clear, and we know uh, that about 90 percent uh, of essential commodities in Yemen are imported by private business businesses. Uh, and out of an abundance of caution, uh, the suppliers of these um, uh, these suppliers and financial in institutions uh, may um, uh, may cease uh, that activity, which is important uh, to the humanitarian needs uh, of the Yemeni people. So we heard those concerns loud and clear. Uh, we are taking a close look at the appropriate response. Uh, but what we will continue to do, no question about it, is to stand uh, with UAE, stand with, the Saudi Arabia, stand with Saudi Arabia, uh, and to hold to account uh, Houthi leaders responsible uh, for these terrorist attacks. Yeah, and just a follow up, two, two more points uh, on this issue. USA also has said in its previous statements from the State Department, I believe, and the White House, that it would support UAE in defending its territories. So how does the support is going to unfold in practical terms? That's when, two, is the U.S. going to help in prohibiting the flow of arms and financial support to the Houthis, given the fact that they are supported and backed by Iran? Uh, so to your first question, uh, we work extensively uh, with our Emirati partners, just as we do with our Saudi partners, uh, to provide them uh, with uh, uh, what they need uh, to help defend themselves uh, against these uh, types of uh, types of attacks. Uh, we will uh, continue to do that. Uh, we will continue to work with them in different ways uh, to help them fortify themselves uh, uh, against these attacks. Uh, and your second question about... Yeah. Is the U.S. going to help in prohibiting the flow of arms and financial support to the Houthis, given the fact that they are supported by Iran? Absolutely. And we have been hard at work on that, uh, not only in this administration, but uh, over successive administrations. Uh, you have heard our partners in the Department of Defense uh, speak to uh, seizures at sea, uh, for example, of, wep of weapons that have been uh, bound for Yemen and for the Houthis. Uh, you have seen us shine a bright spotlight uh, on the level of support uh, that Iran uh, and Iran-backed groups are providing to the Houthis. You've heard us speak to uh, the destabilizing role uh, that Iran and its proxies are playing uh, across the region, and that certainly includes uh, in Yemen, and that certainly includes Iran's uh, support for the Houthi movement in Yemen. The question is, do, are you going to stop the flow of arms physically? I mean, are you going to stop it by the force of arms? I mean, I think that's the premise of the question. Well, and, and my answer to that was, yes, we are going to continue to do everything we can to stop the flow of like arms, of like assistance, air raids of stop the flow of arms. I'm sorry. I would like to see attacks intended to stop the flow of arms. You by you you have forces. seen consistent action by the part of this administration and previous administrations uh, to stop the flow of arms, to stop uh, the flow of supplies uh, to the Houthis, and that certainly includes what the Iranians have uh, provided. Mark. Ned, um, on Russia, so there's going to be a call with the Europeans about well, to turn. Sorry, let's close out. Let's close out Yemen, and then we'll we'll come to Russia. Okay. The Houthis uh, have claimed that they were targeting the U.S. air base in UAE yesterday, and the U.S. military has said that uh, they fired Patriots uh, that intercepted uh, their missiles. Will there be any U.S. reaction to the Houthis, and especially that they are targeting? Uh, the U.S. forces in uh, the UAE? Uh, we will continue to hold the Houthis to account uh, for these terrorist attacks. Uh, we will do that in uh, different ways. Uh, we have uh, used a number of tools uh, already, and I uh, suspect you will see us continue to do that uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Uh, Yemen? Still? Just one more on Yemen. Sure. Um, has the U.S. reached any different conclusion about what impact what the impact on aid delivery would be with the designation and if not why entertain the idea well we are uh, engaging with some of those same same stakeholders uh, i mentioned before uh, to um, uh, continue to hear their viewpoints uh, to garner their perspectives um, certainly some of the concerns uh, we heard uh, about a year ago um, would still apply the question is uh, whether we can, uh, whether a redesignation uh, would um, 
uh, would be to would be in the interests uh, of of the United States, would be in our uh, security interests, would be in the security interests uh, of our uh, partners in the region, uh, and would be in the interests we have uh, in seeing an end to the conflict and the humanitarian emergency uh, in Yemen. Uh, so it was uh, a difficult. Um, uh, it's a difficult set of factors uh, we're weighing, but as the president said, uh, we are considering uh, uh, we are considering the decision. Uh, anything else on Yemen, Humar? Okay, take two um, on Russia. So there's going to be a call with Europeans this afternoon um, with President Biden. I was wondering. Um, this was asked in the White House briefing as well, but if you could shed light a little bit on what the administration uh, hopes to achieve through this call and. We've heard President Biden last week publicly acknowledge the uh, the cracks within NATO alliance as well as with the with the Europeans on how to how exactly to respond. Have there been any improvements since then with the Europeans? Are you closer to being on the same page? And is there any reason for us to expect that after this call you will be sort of you know more on the same page on how to respond to minor incursion or major incursion, whatever that may be? Okay. Uh, Humayr, as you know, we were in Europe last week. Uh, we were in uh, Kyiv. Uh, we, we then went to Berlin, where in addition to meeting with our German allies, uh, the Secretary had an opportunity to meet uh, with the so-called European Quad. Uh, before that, uh, we were in uh, Europe the previous month, uh, where we had an opportunity to meet with our NATO allies, uh, with the OSCE in the intervening weeks the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, not to mention the President, the National Security Advisor, and many others, uh, were on the phone constantly uh, with allies uh, and partners uh, to discuss this Russian aggression uh, and the response. Uh, and I want to take issue with the premise of your question, because in all of those engagements, the in-person engagements, uh, the conversations, the video conferences, uh, in every single one of those engagements, uh, we have heard, and you in turn have heard from not only us, uh, but from our European allies uh, and partners, individual allies, NATO, the OSCE, the G7, uh, the European Union, the European Council, uh, you have heard the same message. Uh, if any Russian forces move across uh, the border, that's a renewed invasion, it will be met with a swift, severe, and united response on the part of the United States and on the part of our allies. Uh, so there is no ambiguity about that. Uh, there is no ambiguity. There is, uh, 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 there is no daylight. Uh, we know that. Uh, and importantly, the Russian Federation knows that. Right. So th OK, uh, thank you. There's quite a bit of daylight, but I'm not going to um, entertain that for too, too long. I I, was I, one, I'm I, wondering, can you shed a little bit light on what you um, what you guys want to achieve with this particular meeting, and then I'm going to go on to the uh, the non-paper. Well, let me let me come back to your uh, flippant remark, and maybe it was just intended to be a flippant remark, but I I, I couldn't resist. No, it's just uh, a, I mean the the president has <laughs> said that um, there are differences of opinion, and this has been something that we've we've I, been experiencing, yeah. we, we've been seeing. Uh, what well. what you have heard from the president, what you have heard from the secretary, what you have heard from the national security advisor, what you have heard from others is that in the event of Russian aggression against Ukraine, uh, there will be uh, a response. It will be swift. It will se be severe. Uh, in the event of uh, an incursion, it will be unprecedented uh, in terms of uh, the steps we are prepared to take. And you can say that there's daylight, um, but I hope you also take a look uh, and listen to the statements that have emanated from European capitals, the statements that have emanated from NATO, from the OSCE, from the G7, from the European Commission, from the United States, from our allies standing next to Secretary Blinken, whether that was Foreign Minister Baerbach, uh, whether it was uh, other allies and partners with whom uh, we have met in recent uh, weeks and over the past two months. So one can claim there is daylight, but uh, certainly if you take a look uh, at the volume and the material uh, that is uh, prominently within the public record, uh, I think that would belie that assertion. 
Are you guys going to be sending this non-paper um, like this week? Can you talk a little bit about the technicalities of that, what it would entail? So as the Secretary said on Friday, uh, we do expect to be in a position to uh, send a written response this week. Um, before we do that, and what we are doing right now, and this gets to your earlier question about the engagement with our European allies uh, and partners, uh, what we have been doing, as you know and have you, as you've seen, is constant coordination and consultation uh, with our allies and partners on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, we've been doing this uh, in terms of uh, the unprecedented uh, swift, strong, severe, united response uh, that Russia uh, would endure in the event of uh, further aggression, but we've also been doing it in the context uh, of the written response uh, that we will provide to uh, the Russian Federation, just as we've been doing it in response to uh, what we've been saying about areas where there may uh, be the potential for progress uh, on reciprocal steps uh, that could enhance uh, our collective security. And by collective security, I mean the security of the transatlantic community, uh, but also potentially uh, address some of the concerns uh, that Russia has put forward. So um, as we consider the next step in our engagement, and that is, in fact, uh, the um, provision of a written response to the Russian Federation. Uh, we are uh, sharing uh, those ideas um, uh, with uh, our, we have shared those ideas with our European allies and partners. We are taking their feedback. We are incorporating that feedback uh, into uh, the written response. And when we're prepared to transmit it, uh, we will. I do expect that will be this week. Uh, Francesca. Ned, so you said there's no daylight on the response, and we will see that. But there's clearly, and it's public out there, uh, uh, daylight on the um, characterization of the threat. Yeah, the, the, the European, uh, French, and others, uh, Mr. Borrell, seem to be pretty annoyed by the alarm, alarming tone in Washington about uh, an imminent threat. And they're, they've, they've been saying, we don't have to get a nervous breakdown. We have to calm down. And, and we don't see that. Uh, so imminent threat, as the, the U.S. says. Uh, do you still say there's, there's an imminent threat of invasion? What, what, why there is this difference between you and the Europeans? Francesco, uh, we don't see the difference you refer to. Uh, what, They're saying it. What, what, They're what, publicly what, saying what, saying what we difference. do see and, and what, what you can see, too, are the statements. And the, statements, the statement that, for example, came from the European Commission uh, that said in strikingly uh, similar, uh, if not um, uh, if not identical, language uh, to the statement that emanated from the G7 and NATO uh, regarding the consequences that would befall the Russian Federation in the event uh, of such aggression against Ukraine. Uh, it has this has not been the United States uh, alone making this case. Uh, we have been uh, speaking as a chorus. Uh, with our European allies and partners, uh, with multilateral institutions and bodies like NATO and the OSCE and the G7. Uh, and again, if you take a look at the language, and you won't be surprised to hear uh, this uh, was not unintentional, uh, you will see strikingly similar language uh, across our allies and partners uh, and across these multilateral institutions. Uh, when it comes to what the Russians have planned, uh, it is clear as day. Uh, that anyone uh, can see the uh, massive buildup uh, of Russian forces along Ukraine's borders. Uh, we have been very clear uh, about our concerns uh, when it comes to other forms of aggression and provocations that uh, the Russians might uh, seek to take uh, and uh, have already taken. Uh, but there's only one person who knows what the Russian Federation uh, has in store for Ukraine, and that's Vladimir Putin. Our goal has been uh, to deter and to uh, defend against any such plans, just as uh, we are ready to continue down the path of diplomacy and dialogue. You have seen us continue down that path of diplomacy and dialogue in a sincere uh, and steadfast way uh, over uh, recent weeks. Uh, the Secretary's travel to um, Geneva ultimately last week was just the latest uh, step in that process that has also involved uh, the Deputy Secretary in her meetings with the Russian Federation at the Strategic Stability Dialogue, uh, the meetings at the NATO-Russia Council, uh, the engagement in the context uh, of the OSCE, and other allies uh, have also been uh, engaging the Russian Federation 
uh, to this end. Uh, so to be very clear, we are prepared to continue down this path. Uh, this path can only be successful if it takes place in the context of de-escalation. But just because we are ready and engaged in the process and path of diplomacy and dialogue uh, doesn't mean we aren't preparing with defense and deterrence. Uh, we are doing both at the same time, uh, precisely because we are ready for either choice that Vladimir Putin makes. And do you consider there's an imminent threat of attack, that the, 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 the attack could be imminent, immediate, as the Europeans say you are telling them, according to your intelligence? Well, we have been clear uh, about this uh, in any number of venues, including uh, in the consular advisory we issued last night. Uh, the threat that uh, we are seeing uh, that is uh, clear not only to us, but clear uh, to any casual observer, given what is taking place along Ukraine's borders, uh, what is taking place uh, within what should be sovereign Belarusian territory, uh, it is a cause for uh, great concern. Uh, and so we are taking prudent steps. We, of course, are uh, sharing information and intelligence uh, with our allies. Uh, that speaks to uh, our concern and also speaks to the fact uh, that uh, the Russians certainly seem to be poised uh, to be able to t undertake uh, aggressive action against Ukraine uh, at any moment. Uh, and just one, one, one last Francisco Should we, should we expect um, a new uh, encounter or meeting or virtual meeting between the Secretary and uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov after the written response? Well, you heard from the Foreign Minister last week. You also heard from the Secretary last week uh, that uh, we will provide uh, a written response. Uh, we are open uh, to additional uh, engagements, in-person engagements. Um, should it be, uh, should it prove useful? Um, if we think it could be constructive, uh, if we think it should be uh, the next element uh, as we pursue the path uh, of dialogue and diplomacy. So we're, we're open to it. Uh, Roslyn. Um, following on uh, Francesco's uh, question, two minutes ago the Pentagon spokesperson said, and I'm uh, roughly quoting here, that uh, if NATO should activate the NRF, all told, the number of forces that the Secretary, Mr. Alston, has placed on heightened alert comes up to about 8,500 personnel. In that, in that scope, the former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, John Herbst, told NPR this morning that he thought that any talk of having U.S. forces forward deployed as an additional deterrent should have been done before now. Why has it come to this weekend that the Biden administration is deciding to put U.S. forces in a forward deployed position as part of NATO to basically send a message to Vladimir Putin? Well, uh, let me uh, make a couple points. First, um, I'm going to defer to my colleague and uh, my, my predecessor uh, to speak to uh, the, the plans that the Pentagon uh, is, is working on. Uh, but the president uh, has been very clear uh, about the consequences that would befall the Russian Federation if Russia were to uh, move forward with additional aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we've spoken of the economic uh, and financial consequences uh, that uh, Russia would endure uh, that would in many ways be unprecedented measures that uh, we very pointedly uh, opted not to take uh, in the aftermath of uh, 2014. Uh, we have spoken of the additional uh, levels of defensive uh, security assistance that we would be prepared to uh, provide to our Ukrainian partners uh, above and beyond the $650 million that we have provided to Kyiv uh, within uh, last year alone. That is more security assistance than has ever been provided in a single year uh, to uh, our partners uh, in Ukraine. But the president has also been clear that if the Russians were to go forward, uh, that we would uh, reinforce the, the so-called eastern flank uh, of NATO. Uh, but even as we have said that, uh, we have never ruled out the option of providing additional assistance in advance of a potential invasion. Uh, and so there are a number of consequences that we have spelled out that the Russian Federation would uh, endure. There are a number of steps uh, that we are taking now in terms of our defensive security assistance uh, to Ukraine, uh, in terms of uh, the deterrent uh, messaging that we're putting forward uh, about the consequences that would befall the Russian Federation, and now what you're hearing from my colleague at the Pentagon. Uh, following on that, have these discussions about whether to use U.S. troops, has that been part of the ongoing response within the Biden administration before these reports became publicly known this weekend? Was that an active part 
of the discussion on how to deal with the uh, Russian aggression? I, I would say generally, without speaking to internal deliberations, that uh, something like this typically uh, would not become public if it were just introduced. Uh, we've been considering a number of steps, uh, and you're hearing the Pentagon speak publicly to it today. The fact that they are speaking publicly to it today uh, suggests that it is not a new ingredient uh, as we consider uh, a response to what we're seeing now. Is this designed to make the Russians perhaps rethink the deployment of additional troops inside Belarus and try to uh, beef up its uh, presence in the southern part of Ukraine. Our goal in all of this uh, is to both defend and deter. Uh, so we are taking a number of steps uh, in the defense uh, of Ukraine, including by providing defensive uh, security assistance, but taking a number of steps uh, to deter uh, what uh, the Russian Federation and, and what Vladimir Putin specifically uh, may have in mind. Uh, so to your question, yes. And then one more. Um, the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. gave a briefing earlier today, and the question came up, what sorts of conversations has she been having with other members on the Security Council about this situation? And Ambassador Thomas Greenfield even allowed that she has been talking with her Russian counterparts. What has she been charged with saying to Ambassador Nebenzia about the uh, threat that the U.S. sees to Ukraine's sovereignty? And why hasn't the U.S. pushed for a Security Council meeting on this matter before Russia takes over the presidency next Tuesday? Well, I think you also heard from the ambassador that she has been uh, very engaged uh, with her uh, counterparts on the Security Council and her broader set of counterparts uh, at the UN. Uh, she did acknowledge that she's been in touch with uh, her Russian counterpart, but I can assure you, and I think as you also heard from her, uh, that her Russian counterpart is not the only counterpart she is speaking with. And I would expect uh, you would hear from her that her engagement uh, with uh, our uh, allies, uh, including those on the Security Council and our partners, um, has been much more extensive uh, than has her engagement been uh, with her uh, Russian counterpart on the Security Council. But in terms of the message, the message that the Russians have been hearing from us uh, has been clear and it also has been consistent. Uh, it has been clear and consistent in public. It's been clear and consistent uh, in private. First and foremost, uh, we prefer the path of diplomacy and dialogue. Uh, we believe it's the only responsible way uh, to uh, pursue a de-escalation uh, and to put an end to uh, Russian ongoing aggression against Ukraine and what any other plans uh, that the Russian Federation uh, may have in store. Uh, they've also heard, and they've heard this in our private, uh, private engagements, but also uh, very publicly as well, uh, that just as we are prepared for dialogue and diplomacy, uh, we are pursuing uh, defense and deterrence. And we've spoken to that ex uh, extensively already today. Um, but the Russians know, uh, because they have heard it from us uh, directly, that we are prepared to engage. Uh, they know that uh, there are some issues uh, where uh, we think that dialogue and diplomacy uh, may uh, redound positively on our uh, collective security, the collective security of the transatlantic community, uh, and it could help uh, respond to some of the uh, concerns that the Russian Federation has made. But they've also heard from us, and this is just as important, uh, that there are other areas, uh, including NATO's open door policy, uh, where there is no trade space, absolutely none. Uh, and so across all of our engagements, whether it is uh, the Secretary, the Deputy Secretary, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, uh, those messages have been clear and consistent. Uh, Saeed. Anything else on, on okay, it's, I see there may be a couple other questions. Uh, ben. Uh, your partial evacuation uh, of the embassy clearly shows that you're concerned about the safety of Americans uh, in Ukraine. And you've also made it very clear what would happen if Russia were to invade. Will you take this opportunity now also to warn Russia against harming any Americans and say what the consequence would be if they did? Uh, so let me, let me take that question uh, and make clear that we have no higher priority uh, than the safety and security uh, of Americans around the world. Uh, and last night, uh, you heard us speak to the prudent steps we are taking uh, in the context of our uh, diplomatic community in Kyiv, uh, knowing uh, that uh, the Russians uh, have this uh, large military buildup, uh, that they could well be poised uh, to take significant aggressive action uh, at any moment. And so the authorized departure of 
uh, non-emergency uh, employees of our embassy, uh, and the ordered departure uh, of dependents is part and parcel uh, of and reflective of uh, the paramount priority we attach to the safety and security uh, of the American people. Uh, I don't want to go into uh, private uh, discussions, but we have made it abundantly clear uh, to the Russians the priority we attach to the safety and security of the American people. Uh, they know uh, that uh, that is our highest priority. Uh, they know uh, that we go to extraordinary lengths uh, to protect uh, their safety and security, and I'll leave it at that. In terms of the numbers of people, of Americans inside Ukraine, yesterday I know that uh, the State Department wouldn't be drawn on exact numbers, but is that because you don't know how many, or you just won't say how many Americans are inside Ukraine? Our goal uh, always is to provide you with timely uh, and accurate information. And right now, uh, we do not have uh, an account that we consider to be accurate uh, of the number of Americans, private Americans, uh, who are resident in Ukraine. And I'll tell you why. You've heard this in the context of Afghanistan, but when Americans travel overseas, uh, they, of course, are not required uh, to register uh, with the embassy in country. Uh, we always encourage Americans to register when they're traveling abroad with our so-called STEP system. Uh, but I think as many of you can attest, when you travel overseas, you, you may not always do that. Uh, and some of you um, probably have never done that. Uh, similarly, when Americans depart the country, uh, they uh, would need to deregister uh, themselves. Uh, and so given that um, many may not register in the first place, I think it is a safe assumption that many would, those out who actually do register uh, may not uh, remove themselves uh, from that tally of uh, American citizens who may be resident in a foreign country. The other point is that even when people do register, uh, the State Department is not in a position to independently verify uh, that a person who has uh, signed up in STEP, the so-called STEP system, uh, is actually an American citizen. Uh, so there are a number, for a number of reasons, uh, the uh, tally, uh, we just don't have an accurate tally at the moment. Uh, when we uh, have message with the American people uh, in uh, private American citizen community in Kyiv, uh, in Ukraine, uh, in, in recent days, uh, we have encouraged them uh, to fill out a form uh, that will help us uh, acquire greater granularity uh, on the size of the American, private American citizen uh, community uh, in Ukraine. Uh, but that's just not something that we have right now. Uh, one more. You mentioned Afghanistan. I wonder if there, is there anything from Afghanistan that you learned about identifying and rescuing Americans inside a war zone that you think can be applied here? Uh, well, these are obviously not uh, analogous situations, and so I would hate to um, suggest, uh, suggest otherwise. Our primary charge uh, is to um, uh, keep the U.S. citizen community informed uh, of safety and security developments. Uh, that is what we did most recently uh, yesterday evening uh, when we issued the updated uh, travel advisory and accompanying media note uh, to keep them informed of safety and security developments. Um, and that can include uh, information on uh, commercial travel options. Um, we have done this because, as the President has said, uh, military action by Russia could come at any time. Uh, and we all know uh, and we have, we have all seen indications that, the, that that is the case, given the large-scale uh, military buildup. Uh, we've also been clear that uh, we won't be in a position to evacuate U.S. citizens, private U.S. citizens, in such a contingency. Uh, and so that is why we have encouraged uh, private U.S. citizens uh, who may be in Ukraine uh, to plan accordingly, including by availing themselves uh, of commercial options should they choose to leave the country. Uh, even though we uh, are uh, reducing the size of our embassy footprint, uh, the embassy uh, is there to assist American uh, citizens uh, in this. We, are in a, we have the ability to provide, for example, repatriation loans uh, for any Americans who seek uh, to, re to avail themselves uh, of those commercial options uh, to return to the United States. Can I follow up on that? Uh, yeah. Do you don't mind? Sure. Um, first, what do you want to achieve from the meeting with, that Biden is having with, uh, with European leaders? Presumably it's building on Mr. Blinken's meeting this morning. So what do you want to achieve from that? Two, in the meeting this morning that Mr. Blinken had with the European Council, did he get questions about the U.S. decision to start downsizing the embassy because 
some Europeans are not on the same page. And as Francesca was saying, we're suggesting that uh, the rhetoric needed to be dialed down a bit, that there wasn't uh, any difference in security to suggest an imminent attack. So what do you expect to achieve? And what did Mr. Blinken hear about, about the American approach? Uh, so as you alluded to, Barbara, the secretary did take part uh, earlier today uh, in the EU's Foreign Affairs Council. Uh, he was invited by uh, the EU High Representative Joseph Borrell. Uh, to give you a, a flavor of that, the secretary briefed uh, his counterparts on his visit last week to Kyiv, uh, to Berlin, and to Geneva uh, as part of uh, the effort we have spoken to to de-escalate uh, the tension that's been caused by Russia's unprovoked uh, military buildup and its continued aggression against Ukraine. Um, in the uh, engagement this morning, uh, the Secretary emphasized that we will continue to coordinate closely with uh, the EU and its member states, uh, in addition to the other multilateral institutions uh, we've already mentioned, that's NATO, that's the OSCE, uh, and with individual uh, allies uh, and, and partners. Uh, and uh, in the course of this meeting, uh, the Secretary uh, demonstrated that by uh, briefing them uh, on the engagements last week, of course, including the engagement with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, you saw that uh, shortly after the meeting with Foreign Minister Lavrov concluded uh, on Friday, the Secretary also had a chance to speak to his uh, Ukrainian counterpart uh, to back brief him uh, on those discussions. And that's a practice we've undertaken uh, in the course of all of our engagements uh, with uh, our European allies, our European partners, of course, including uh, our Ukrainian partners, uh, because we are operating uh, by the maxim of nothing about them uh, without them, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, nothing about Europe without Europe, nothing about NATO uh, without NATO. So uh, the Secretary's participation uh, in the meeting today uh, was another opportunity and another venue uh, for us to do just that. Uh, the President, of course, has been deeply engaged uh, in this as well. Uh, you saw um, that he convened his team uh, both in person and virtually at Camp David over the weekend uh, to discuss this. Uh, so it should not come as a surprise uh, that the President will have an opportunity uh, to speak to his counterpart uh, on these very issues uh, with that same, uh, with that, uh, same uh, maxim in mind. Uh, when it comes to uh, the decision that uh, we made last night, uh, I just want to reiterate uh, the core point, and that is uh, that this is about uh, one criterion and one criterion alone, and that is the safety and security uh, of our uh, team on the ground uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and it was a prudent step uh, when it came to the ordered departure uh, of dependents. It was a prudent step when it came to the authorized departure uh, of non-essential employees. Uh, but let me also be clear uh, that that decision uh, says nothing about our commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and to its territory and territorial, territorial integrity. Uh, our commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is unwavering. Uh, the embassy continues to operate, and the charge, uh, of course, remains in Ukraine. Uh, the fact that we're taking prudent precautions uh, for the sake of uh, and the safety of U.S. citizens uh, in no way uh, undermines our support for uh, or commitment to Ukraine. Uh, you've seen that support take any number of forms. Uh, of course, uh, the Secretary was just in Kyiv uh, last week, where you heard him reiterate these messages next to President Zelensky, next to Foreign Minister Kuleba. Uh, we have continued to uh, provide uh, defensive security assistance. Uh, the first delivery of the additional tranche of $200 million that was authorized in December uh, arrived in Kyiv uh, overnight, Friday into Saturday. Uh, we will continue uh, to provide defensive security assistance uh, to our partners, and we will continue to signal in no uncertain terms uh, the enduring commitment we have uh, to the territorial integrity uh, and the sovereignty of, of our partner Ukraine. Yeah, let me, let, please. The Ukrainian government clearly opposed this move, and the foreign ministry today has called it excessive, excessively cautious. Um, is there a sense in the administration that this could have created a panic within Ukraine at a time when that's exactly what Russia is trying to do by stoking instability in the country? This is about one thing and one thing only. Uh, right. and, and, and Consider it's, it, the panic that it could have created. Did, I'm sorry, did we what? Did you consider the panic that it could have created? Uh, what, what we considered uh, is the safety and security of the American people. Uh, and 
Uh, this is a decision that only the United States government can make um, because it is a priority uh, that uh, we attach to the safety and security of, in this case, uh, our colleagues uh, and their families as well. Uh, this says uh, nothing to our unwavering, unrelenting support uh, for our Ukrainian partners. Uh, it is about one thing and one thing only, uh, the very narrow safety and security considerations of our colleagues. But this combined with the Pentagon's announcement today about putting 8,500 troops on standby, in addition to the very public posturing on Friday with the arrival of the new uh, lethal aid, it does seem like you are escalating your pressure here on Russia in some way. Do you reject that? Do you think that your posture has changed at all? Uh, this is about defense and deterrence. What we are concerned about is the possibility of Russian aggression. That is not about defense. That is not about deterrence. That's about offensive operations against a sovereign country, uh, a sovereign country that uh, is a close partner of the United States. So to equate these two things, uh, is uh, deeply inaccurate, uh, and it also uh, is precisely what we're hearing uh, out of Moscow. Uh, these are qualitatively uh, different elements uh, uh, and different steps uh, that we are taking. Were the Russians to uh, de-escalate, um, uh, you would not see precisely the same set of moves uh, from uh, our Ukrainian partners, from NATO, uh, from the United States. Here's, here's the broader point, and you've heard the Secretary make this point repeatedly. He actually, um, in the meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov on Friday, uh, made, this directly, made this point directly to the Foreign Minister. Uh, and he said, the United States genuinely does not understand uh, Russia's strategic posturing here. Because uh, across the years, uh, and in the context of uh, this escalation, uh, Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation has uh, precipitated everything that it has sought to prevent. And you've heard the Secretary speak to uh, the increasing support for NATO membership among Ukrainians since 2014, levels of support that have uh, just about doubled. Uh, you have heard um, us and NATO as an alliance speak to the reassurance initiatives that were precipitated precisely by Russia's unprovoked aggression against Ukraine uh, in 2014. Uh, so the Russians uh, may well uh, complain uh, and may well take note and point to uh, these uh, efforts towards defense uh, and deterrence, uh, but it is their aggression that has uh, precipitated precisely what it is uh, we're hearing and seeing them point to. And here's the other concern, and we have made no bones about this are concerned that uh, the Russians, as they did in 2014, uh, may be seeking to manufacture a pretext for additional aggression against Ukraine. Uh, if you wanted to do that, this is in some ways what it would look like. Uh, that is what has concerned us for some time. It is why we have spoken to uh, not only that concern broadly, uh, but why we have put forward uh, information in our possession specifically uh, that speaks to the steps uh, that the Russian Federation may be taking towards this, uh, towards this end. Can I just one last uh, let, let, me, let me just let, let Connor finish. No, it's okay. Just one last question. Um, specifically on the, the question of NATO's unity, um, the Ukrainian foreign minister again said that Germany is undermining unity in the alliance, in part because they're blocking Estonia from transferring weapons. They won't provide weapons themselves. The comments from their naval chief over the weekend, or last week, um, do you have any response to that, this idea that, that Germany is not doing enough within the alliance to, to support a uni unified front? The uh, Secretary had a chance to meet not only with uh, Chancellor Schultz, but also with uh, Foreign Minister Baerbach uh, last week in Berlin. And the Foreign Minister was actually asked this question standing right next to the Secretary. Uh, and she spoke to precisely what Germany is doing, the important contributions uh, that Germany is making uh, to uh, Ukraine. I will leave it to Germany to, to speak to those uh, important uh, contributions. But uh, to be clear, uh, there is no daylight uh, among our allies and our partners uh, about uh, the serious consequences that would befall the Russian Federation uh, if it were to go forward. Just one thing on, on Ukraine. One, one, one final thing on, on Ukraine. What would de-escalation look like? I mean, do they have to? Now, it is alleged that they have 100,000 troops along the, in their own territory along the border. So de-escalation would look like maybe if they withdrew 
25,000 troops, 50, I mean, what would the escalation look like? Uh, it, it could include that. Uh, I'm not going to be prescriptive. Is there, is there like a I, figure you would like to see? I, look, I'm not going to be prescriptive about that. I think de-escalation can take many forms. Uh, it can uh, take the form of uh, what we're seeing uh, and what we have seen uh, along Ukraine's borders. It can take the form of what uh, we are seeing uh, in terms of Russian activity and what should be uh, another sovereign, sovereign country, Belarus. Uh, it could take the form of what we are hearing from the Russian Federation. De-escalation can take many forms. Uh, it can take many forms as an initial step. Uh, and that is what uh, we would like to see uh, with the end goal in mind of uh, seeing Russian forces uh, return to uh, their uh, permanent barracks uh, to cease this and put an end and reverse uh, this uh, buildup along Ukraine's borders uh, to cease with uh, the aggressive rhetoric. Um, De-escalation can take many forms. Uh, well, we would, only, we would only, welcome any of it. Only if Russian forces are back in their barracks at all times will, will be considered de-escalation. No, I, my, my point is that there uh, are many forms de-escalation de can take. There's also a continuum. Uh, we would welcome, uh, at least as an initial step, uh, any form uh, of de-escalation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Are you aware of the meeting that uh, will be held in Paris on Wednesday between uh, Ukrainian and Russian uh, officials? And do you expect any breakthrough? Uh, yes. So I, I do not expect um, any um, uh, American uh, involvement uh, in that. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, as you know, we're consulting uh, with allies and partners, uh, including Ukraine, to determine the next steps, uh, and we're in communication with, uh, uh, with the Russian Federation as well, as we've said. Um, we do believe that uh, diplomacy is the be best uh, path forward, uh, and we're prepared to uh, support uh, dialogue and diplomacy um, that uh, serves to de-escalate tensions. Uh, so we are uh, supportive of uh, those efforts that are, that are undertaken uh, on the part of the Russian Federation in, in good faith. Your Ukrainian counterpart uh, spokesperson, he, he tweeted while we were in the briefing. Um, I'll read super quickly. There are 129 diplomatic missions in Ukraine. Of these, only four have declared the departure of family members of personnel, US, UK, Australia, and Germany. The rest, including EU, OC, COE, NATO, and UN, have not expressed their intention to follow such premature steps. Do you have a response to that? I don't. That I, 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 I don't have a response to that. My, my only comment would be what you've heard me say before. This is based on one criterion and one criterion alone. It's a priority we attach to the safety and security uh, of our colleagues in Ukraine. Okay, I have an Iran question. Uh, anything else on Russia Ukraine? Yes. Uh, as a follow-up uh, follow on evacuation, I'm from Ukrainian media, ah, and, uh, yeah, and uh, I uh, um, want to make it clear that the uh, United States did not evacuate uh, the diplomats even uh, during the worst day over the last eight years. And uh, Kyiv is far enough from Russian border. Does it mean that from uh, your knowledge and from uh, your intelligence, uh, our capital, Ukrainian capital, is targeted and it is uh, the main target of Russian invasion? Well, look, of course, I'm not going to speak to uh, any intelligence. But uh, as we have said, including in our uh, announcement last night, uh, we are doing this as a um, prudent uh, uh, step. Um, because of continued Russian efforts to destabilize the country and to undermine the security of Ukrainian uh, citizens and others uh, visiting or uh, residing in Ukraine. And United States officials have repeatedly mentioned, and uh, so you are uh, that you don't give up on diplomatic efforts on Russia. Uh, could you please clarify? You have already mentioned about uh, security, uh, um, uh, collective security. What precisely do you mean? What, where is the room for negotiation with Russia, and what is uh, the subject of compromise? Uh, so we have um, consistently said that. Uh, we are willing to engage uh, in dialogue and diplomacy, and we have engaged uh, in dialogue and diplomacy uh, with uh, the Russian Federation, uh, knowing, of course, that the Russians have published uh, their two treaties. Uh, there are certain elements in those treaties, as you've heard us uh, say repeatedly, that are absolute non-starters, uh, including um, uh, NATO's so-called uh, open-door uh, policy. But there are other areas uh, that where dialogue and diplomacy uh, could um, uh, help improve uh, our collective security, uh, transatlantic 
uh, security. Uh, I would make the point that even before uh, this Russian military buildup along Ukraine's borders start, it started, uh, we had already undertaken uh, two uh, convenings of the Strategic Stability Dialogue. Uh, the venue uh, that Deputy Secretary Sherman uh, utilized the other week uh, to meet with her Russian counterpart uh, to discuss some of these issues. And the fact that the so-called SSD uh, started after uh, the summit uh, between President Putin and President Biden in June uh, speaks to the fact uh, that we do believe uh, there are issues when it comes to uh, arms control, for example, uh, where we uh, can uh, potentially have fruitful discussions with uh, the Russians uh, that could address our uh, security concerns, uh, meaning those of the United States uh, and our allies uh, and partners, uh, and could also be responsive uh, to some of the uh, concerns that uh, the Russians have said. So specifically, uh, we've spoken to the placement of missiles in Europe, uh, options for strategic and non-strategic nuclear weapons, uh, other arms control measures, uh, and those designed to increase uh, transparency uh, and stability. The key point in that is that any steps that we would take would not be concessions. Uh, they would need to be on a reciprocal basis, uh, meaning that the Russians would also have to do something uh, that would uh, help improve uh, our, security, uh, our security posture. Uh, the final point on this, uh, all of this has been and will continue uh, to uh, be conducted with uh, thorough and full consultation uh, with our allies and partners, and that includes uh, Ukraine. When the Secretary met with President Zelensky, when he met with President Kuleba, or Foreign Minister Kuleba, uh, when he spoke to Foreign Minister Kuleba on Friday after meeting with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, we are in the practice uh, of being uh, fully transparent with our Ukrainian partners uh, about the issues that are being discussed uh, and the progress uh, of those engagements. Yes. Anything else on Russia-Ukraine? Uh, ben, one last. Um, yes, the Secretary said he was going to raise Paul Whelan and Trevor Reed in his discussions with uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. Is there any update? Do you think the current situation is going to make it better or worse for that situation? And that's really up to the Russian Federation. I can confirm, as the Secretary said before the meeting, uh, that he did uh, raise the cases of uh, Paul Whelan and Trevor Reed, both of whom traveled uh, to Russia as tourists and who have been held unjustly. Um, for far too long, uh, made the point that uh, it is long past time uh, to see them uh, return safely uh, to their families, and we'll continue to uh, continue to work on that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one more on the Russian Ukraine Ukrainian crisis. Does the Biden administration recognize or acknowledge that any incursion or invasion by Russia against Ukraine could trigger a dominant effect on so many issues? I'll, I'll name some examples. China against Taiwan, Iran and its proxies, North Korea and its ballistic missiles against South Korea and Japan, Venezuela, Cuba and their authoritarian suppression tactics and moves. So that the whole world is watching what the U.S. is going to do to stop Russia. How, how do you comment on this? What was the last part? How do we what? How do you comment on this? What, is the how, how Biden administration aware of how critical the whole world is watching, just like what happened in Afghanistan? And then some reports are saying that Russia are taking a page of what happened in Afghanistan and moving against Ukraine or could move. So now if, if they did that, all of this dominance effect could happen. Well, uh, before I get to your broader question, I, I do want to address the last part of your question, uh, and that is Afghanistan. Um, I have a hard time uh, understanding how it is that uh, putting an end to a 20-year military commitment uh, where the United States spent billions upon billions of dollars every year, where thousands of American troops, at one point tens of thousands uh, of American troops were stationed, uh, where there was a NATO commitment, where thousands of NATO troops were stationed for many years, taking casualties, uh, enduring the loss of life uh, with an open-ended military commitment. How were we, were that still to be the case? How we would be better strategically positioned uh, to take on what we're seeing uh, now from the Russian Federation. The President was clear when he made uh, his announcement that we would uh, be putting an end to our military uh, engagement in Afghanistan, that part of the reason that we were doing so uh, was not only to prevent another generation of American service members or NATO service members uh, from uh, fighting and potentially dying in Afghanistan, but to allow us to focus on the threats and the opportunities 
uh, of the 21st century. And so uh, as we take on uh, this Russian aggression, as we uh, seek to engage on this path of defense and deterrence, uh, that is precisely uh, what, what we are doing. So I just wanted to address the, the point about Afghanistan. Yeah, there. Many people saw it as such. Maybe allies are concerned that that might happen now. Uh, first of all, the United States has not turned its back on Afghanistan. Uh, you have uh, seen us uh, consistently partner with and um, uh, demonstrate our enduring commitment to uh, the people of Afghanistan. Uh, and we've done that in any number of ways. I need not uh, run through them uh, right now because we do this uh, consistently. So anyone who is taking uh, any lesson other than the fact that uh, the United States uh, felt it was time to put an end to uh, what had been an open-ended military commitment where thousands upon thousands uh, of American troops uh, have fought and thousands had died, uh, and uh, same for NATO as well, uh, sapped the United States and our NATO partners of billions upon billions, trillions uh, over the course of 20 years. Uh, anyone who would take any lesson from that uh, other than the fact that uh, the United States uh, is positioning itself to take on the threats and opportunities uh, that we face now while we continue uh, to uh, partner with and support the people of Afghanistan, um, that would be a uh, mistaken analysis. But to your, to your question, though, uh, we have thought about that. And that is precisely why the Secretary delivered a speech in Berlin last week uh, that was really on this very question, to make the point that what we are seeing uh, Russia uh, attempt and undertake uh, against Ukraine uh, is important in its own right, of course. Uh, Ukraine uh, is a close partner. Uh, we have um, uh, 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 close friends in the Ukrainian people. Um, but in some ways, this is uh, as important as Ukraine is, even bigger uh, than the question of a, a conflict, uh, Russian-produced conflict, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, this is about what should be the inviolable rules of the so-called rules-based international order. Uh, what should be the inviolable rules that for uh, the past 70 years since the conclusion of World War II uh, has um, protected and uh, really allowed unprecedented levels of security, of stability, of prosperity. Uh, that includes uh, in, the, uh, in Europe, uh, but it also includes uh, in areas well beyond that. Uh, and of course, you hear us talk about the rules-based international order, not only in the case of Europe, uh, and uh, what Russia is doing to undermine it, but in other regions too, notably the Indo-Pacific, uh, where we have similar concerns uh, about what um, certain countries have also uh, sought to do, uh, to undermine, to erode uh, that rules-based international order. So uh, it is not lost on us uh, that uh, the Russians and the implications of what they're doing, uh, as important as they are uh, for Ukraine, go, go well beyond Ukraine. Iran and uh, Kuwait. Yes. Okay. So, sir, I'll, I'll come back to you. Said. Okay. Said, so, so uh, you've already, you've already uh, asked a question. You, okay. You've already well, asked a question I, I during this briefing. I understand. I want to change topics. Sir. I want to ask you about the Palestinian American who died in Israeli custody on the 12th of January. Now, I know that you called on the Israelis that you wanted to see what were the circumstances and so on. First of all, did they respond to you? I mean, that could be any one of my brothers. I'm sorry, what was the last I part? I mean, th that could be, never mind. I'm just saying, did they respond to you? Uh, so we have not yet seen a final report from the Israeli government. Uh, we continue to support a thorough investigation into the circumstances uh, of the incident. We welcome receiving uh, additional information from the Israeli government as soon as possible. Uh, we are deeply concerned uh, by media reports of the circumstances uh, surrounding the death of Mr. Assad. Uh, an American citizen uh, who was found uh, dead uh, after the Israeli military detained him. Uh, as we've said previously, uh, we've been in close contact uh, with uh, his family uh, to offer our condolences, uh, to provide consular services. Uh, we were represented at the, the wake of, of Mr. Assad as well. well he, he died while being handcuffed and gagged and so on. And what kind of, do, they, do you give them a time limit? Do you trust the Israelis to do their own investigation? In as I said, Saeed, we welcome receiving that information as soon as possible. I have a very another quick question. Uh, there are reports that there are 17 Palestinian journalists uh, who are detained today. Is that something that you would raise with the Israelis to look into what are the circumstances of their imprisonment? Uh, 
We're, we're aware uh, of the reports uh, that you cited. Uh, as we do around the world, we support independent journalists uh, and media, organization, media organizations, and uh, you've heard us speak before of the indispensability uh, of their reporting, uh, especially um, in areas where tensions are high or, or conflict uh, may erupt. Uh, we believe that respect for human rights, for fundamental uh, freedoms, and a strong civil society are critically important to responsible and responsive governance. And finally, uh, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, last we spoke out and highlighted the settler violence and aggression against the Palestinians. Yet we have seen only you know, increase uh, in, the, in the violence over the past few days. Is, there, is that something that you would raise, or you are too busy with issues like Ukraine and Iran and all these things? I mean, you understandably so. Said, we're a, we're a large government, we're a large department. Um, not to uh, use an overused metaphor, but uh, we can walk and chew gum uh, at the same time. Uh, when it comes to the issue you raised, uh, you have heard us uh, speak to this. You cited some comments recently. The State Department uh, has previously commented on this as well. We believe it is critical for all parties uh, to refrain from steps that exacerbate tensions and undercut efforts to advance a negotiated two-state solution. Uh, this includes violence against civilians and settler violence. Can I ask about Iran? Try to uh, sure. So two Iran questions. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, Iran's foreign minister on Monday said they're ready to consider dire talks with the United States if it, if they feel they can get a good deal with guarantees. Either way, has there been any communication on this? And are you are you guys considering having direct talks with them? Uh, Humaira, as, as you know, um, we are prepared to meet directly. Uh, we have consistently uh, held the position that it would be much more productive uh, to engage with Iran directly uh, on both uh, JCPOA negotiations and, and on other issues. Uh, it, this extends to uh, bilateral uh, as well as multilateral formats. Uh, meeting directly would enable more efficient communication, uh, which is urgently, urgently needed to swiftly reach an understanding on a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA. Uh, uh, we've made this point before, but given the pace of Iran's nuclear uh, advancements, uh, time is running very short. Um, uh, until the non-proliferation benefits that the JCPOA uh, conveyed uh, as initially uh, drafted and implemented in uh, drafted in 2015 and implemented in 2016 uh, are outweighed by the nuclear advancements that uh, Iran has made. Uh, so we are seeking to um, uh, conduct this diplomacy urgently, uh, and we've been consistently very clear uh, that being able to engage directly uh, would uh, serve those purposes. Given your, your uh, position just now and what they said should we expect this to happen soon? Is there any reason why this could happen soon? Is, has there been any communication indirectly about you, you, making this happen? Soon? You would you would have to ask officials in Tehran. Uh, we this is not the first time we've made this point. We have made this point uh, consistently uh, up until now. The Iranians have insisted on the indirect format uh, in Vienna. We have long uh, noted the fact that indirect talks, especially on an issue of this complexity and of this importance, uh, is a hindrance. So. Uh, our position has been clear. I would uh, direct you to authorities in Iran. My final thing on this, we've had an interview with uh, Special Envoy Mali yesterday who said it, he, it would be hard to imagine for U.S. to clinch a deal with Iran unless U.S. hostages are released. I just want to push you a little bit on why the administration isn't willing to say outright that they won't rejoin JCPOA unless American citizens are released. Well, uh, what the special envoy said is that it is, quote, very hard for us to imagine getting back into the nuclear deal while four innocent Americans are being held hostage by Iran. Yes. Uh, this is the point he has made uh, repeatedly before. Um, so this is, uh, should not be news. Uh, it also, I can tell you, is not news to the Iranians. Uh, they have heard uh, this position indirectly uh, from us before as well. Um, but the special envoy also made the point uh, that these issues are operating on separate tracks. Uh, and they're operating on separate tracks for a very simple reason. Uh, a mutual return to compliance uh, with the JCPOA is, at best, an uncertain proposition. Uh, we want to see these Americans who have been held against their will uh, for years on end, away from their families, uh, returned as soon as possible. Uh, it would not serve our purposes, it would not serve their interests to tie their fates uh, to a proposition that I said before is uncertain at best. Uh, so uh, that is why it certainly colors uh, our uh, interactions, um, but these are operating on separate tracks. Uh, the, the, the way you, you tell me, you, you, you just, uh, 
very much like the preconditions. Uh, again, uh, it is uh, not the case uh, that there is any uh, direct or explicit linkage precisely because a uh, mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA is at best an uncertain proposition. Uh, we want the return of these Americans to be a certain proposition. Uh, and so we are keeping these issues separate. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Kuwait's uh, foreign minister visited Beirut on Saturday and delivered uh, confidence building proposals to Lebanon in a message coordinated with the Gulf states. And he is visiting Washington uh, this week. Are you aware of the proposal? And is there any link between his visits to Beirut and uh, uh, Washington? Well, I do expect when the Secretary meets with his Kuwaiti counterpart on Wednesday that they will have an opportunity to discuss Lebanon. Uh, it is something that uh, the United States, uh, together with our partners, uh, including our partners in the Gulf, the French, and others, uh, we've been very, very focused on. So I think we'll have more to say in the aftermath of uh, the bilateral meeting on Wednesday. Thanks. Yes. Um, for our colleague, uh, Tracy Wilkinson, on Honduras. Um, rival factions in its Congress may derail Thursday's inauguration of the new president whom the State Department was quick to embrace. Uh, Vice President Harris is scheduled to, to travel for the inauguration. Is the U.S. doing anything to defuse that crisis? Well, uh, what I'll say is that the selection of the new provisional leadership uh, at the Honduran National Congress is a sovereign decision of Honduras. Uh, we look forward to deepening our work together with the incoming Castro administration uh, and Hondurans from across the political spectrum to advance our uh, shared interests. Uh, we call on political actors to remain calm, uh, to engage in dialogue, to refrain from violence and provocative rhetoric, uh, and we urge their supporters to express themselves peacefully uh, while respecting uh, the rule of law. Uh, as you know, uh, Vice President Harris uh, has already had an opportunity to be in touch uh, with um, President-elect Castro uh, to congratulate her on her historic victory uh, as Honduras's uh, first woman president. Uh, in that conversation last month, they discussed their shared interest in working together uh, to address the root causes of migration, uh, to promote inclusive economic opportunity for the people of Honduras to improve um, uh, to uh, combat corruption, to reduce security threats, uh, and to improve access uh, to health uh, and education. And Hold on, Turkey, for my VOA colleagues. Sure. Do you have a, was there a follow-up, no, Connor? Just a, no, another question. So go ahead, Barbara. So if you don't mind, the, uh, my VOA colleague would wondered if there's any reaction from the State Department to two cases with, regarding restrictions on free expression in Turkey. One is last Saturday, a well-known Turkish journalist was jailed for insulting President Erdogan. Today, the state agency, a state, the state has fined the TV channel for which she works. The second case is a famous musician who was getting threats by Islamist and nationalist groups uh, for something she wrote a while ago, and President Erdogan threatened to silence her during Friday prayers, saying, quote, it is our duty to cut those tongues, unquote. Do you have any um, reaction to these cases? Well, this applies uh, in Turkey, but it is uh, universal in its application as well, and that is the fact that uh, we believe freedom of expression strengthens democracy, uh, and it needs to be protected. Uh, even when it involves speech, uh, some may find controversial or some may find uh, uncomfortable. Uh, we're aware of and we're disappointed by the attention and arrest of uh, Sedef Kabas, uh, one of the cases uh, you referenced, and those principles apply equally to Turkey as they do to any other country. Burkina Faso, uh, the military has taken to TV to declare that they're in power. The president's office denied that. Um, but the president hasn't been seen. Are you aware of what's unfolding? Is there a coup? Have you uh, begun an assessment of whether or not there is one? Well, we're aware of reports that the president of Burkina Faso has been detained uh, by members of the country's military. Our embassy team in Ouagadougou is monitoring the situation and maintains communication with international partners, uh, as well as with officials from President Kabore's government. Uh, we call for the immediate release of President Kabore and other government officials, uh, and for members of the security forces to respect Burkina Faso's constitution and civilian leadership. We urge all sides in this fluid situation to remain calm and to seek dialogue as a means to resolve grievances. Uh, we, uh, our embassy in Ouagadougou has advised U.S. citizens in Burkina Faso uh, that a mandatory curfew has been implemented by local authorities, and U.S. citizens are advised to take shelter, avoid large crowds, and to monitor uh, local media for updates. The U.S. provides a significant amount of 
aid to Burkina Faso. Are you undertaking a, a coup assessment? So this is an evolving situation. Uh, it's a situation that uh, remains fluid. It has continued to uh, develop even within recent hours, so it's too soon to characterize, uh, at least officially for us, the nature of ongoing developments. Uh, we have called for restraint by all actors uh, as we carefully review the events on the ground for any potential impact on our assistance. Your Honor, very quick follow-up. Uh, AFP just reported that or attributed to a high-level American official as saying they, w they would like to see direct talks with Iran. Can you confirm that? You want direct talks with Iran? On I, I, I thought we just discussed this for five minutes with Sorry, you. Yep, we, must, we do. You must have missed it. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, so what, what is hoped to be achieved by direct talks instead of what's going on in Vienna now? Well, we just had a rather lengthy exchange on this, so I, I would refer you to that. Uh, a couple final questions. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, is there any update you can give on the ISIS jailbreak in northern Syria, um, either in terms of coalition support and the number of escapees, and then just like, what does the strike or uh, what does it say about the SD SDF's ability to secure the facilities, and do you see this as? an intelligence failure on the, the part of the coalition? Well, as you probably saw, we issued a statement on this uh, over the weekend, uh, and we condemned the uh, ISIS attack last week on the uh, Hasaka Detention Center in northeast Syria, um, which we understand to have been an attempt to free detained ISIS fighters. Uh, we commend uh, the SDF for their swift response and continued commitment uh, to the fight against ISIS. Uh, and this attack, uh, in our mind, highlights the importance of and the need to fully fund the global coalition to defeat, ISIS, to defeat ISIS's initiatives to improve and secure uh, humane detention of ISIS fighters, including by strengthening detention facility security. Uh, to us, it also underscores the urgent need for countries of uh, origin to repatriate, rehabilitate, reintegrate, and prosecute, where appropriate, their nationals detained in northeast Syria. Uh, we remain committed to the enduring global defeat of ISIS, working by, with, and through the coalition and our and our uh, local partners. But uh, beyond that, for uh, tactical developments on the ground, I need to refer you to DOD. Ben. Um, last night, the State Department said that if there was an invasion of uh, Ukraine, that the U.S. would be unable to evacuate its citizens. I wonder if you could just explain why why that would be. Uh, ben, this is um, uh, this is historically uh, always been the case. Uh, the uh, our primary charge. Uh, is to uh, provide uh, updates and developments and to uh, ensure uh, communication to the private American citizen community in any country, uh, including uh, when we undertake something like order departure uh, or authorized departure. Uh, I know the recent experience uh, of Afghanistan uh, may color uh, the uh, sense uh, that some people uh, have about this, but. Uh, Afghanistan, for reasons that we all know well, uh, was uh, unique. Uh, it was um, something that the United States government uh, had not done before. Uh, and as you have heard us say, in the context of Ethiopia, uh, Ukraine, uh, and, um, uh, and, 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 and other countries, uh, our charge is to continue to provide uh, informational updates to the American citizen community, uh, to provide them uh, services, including repatriation loans, uh, should they need to avail themselves uh, of commercial options. Those commercial options, of course, still exist in the case of uh, Ukraine. Uh, that is why last night's advisory uh, urged Americans to consider uh, availing themselves of those uh, commercial options, and uh, the embassy stands ready to uh, assist uh, in, those, in, in, uh, in those efforts. Thank you all.